Information Security's webcast. We aren't recording yet, but we thought we would share kind of what some of us at uh, Black Hills Information Security are going through right now. By the way, welcome to the basement of my uh, the house that we're building and finishing up. Um, so Sierra, who usually moderates these things, and myself, we live in Leeds, South Dakota. Uh, she's up by Terry Peak, by the ski area, and I'm um, kind of a little bit away from there. Um, but we're in the middle of a blizzard right now. Which is why we sound so terrible. Yeah, well, at least today I have an excuse, which I think is pretty cool. So this webcast, uh, Sierra and myself may disappear. I just kind of drop off the face of the planet, and if we do, well, don't worry, we're okay. It just means that we don't have any power, and it's hot cocoa time. Um, <laughs> no day. So that's what we're doing today. Um, this webcast is also a little bit different in the fact that we've got probably the largest representation of BHIS on a webcast um, uh, that we've ever really had. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. We have uh, Carrie, Brian, Bo, and Sierra, and myself are on. But uh, the show is pretty much going to be ran by uh, by Carrie, Brian, and Bo, since they're the main researchers at BHIS that put this whole thing together, which is uh, which is pretty pretty cool. Uh, Ray Lewis says, "Oh hell no, snow already. We are really far behind um, on snow, and some of us like skiing." Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, a little bit more background on what's coming up. Um, we apparently I'm giving a webcast with Pony Express on social engineering and Internet of Things hacking, which is interesting because I have no idea uh, what that topic is about, but I'm presenting on it, so that's going to be fun. Um, however, closing out this year, kind of right before Christmas, we're going to do our sacred cash cow tipping, and this is probably a surprise to, uh, to Bo, Carrie, and Brian, but sacred cash cow tipping is where we... Um, where we uh, is where we uh, go through and bypass a bunch of AV engines. We'll talk about bypassing Silence and a bunch of products and things that work for BHIS and our penetration tests. And that'll be kind of how we, how we close, closed off this year. So we have two big webcasts still to come. And I also think that we're going to be doing some uh, videos and things like that for Rita as well. So we still got people rolling in. We're at about 270 live. This is one of our biggest webcasts ever. Um, which is pretty exciting. I'll give you guys a little bit more background on the uh, webcast as well here in just a little bit. So let's kind of quick do a sound off. Um, Carrie, Bo, Brian, Sierra, you guys also on? Yes. Hey, everybody. There. Hi. Bo was all sad. He came on like 10 minutes ago, and he's like, oh, there's only 50 people on, you know, and now we're at like 300. So... Um, so hopefully, hopefully Bo, Bo uh, has a has a good group for this. And the, really, Bo, out of a lot of the people at BHIS, has a tremendous amount invested in this. He took a lot of flack for the uh, disclosure, as far as uh, bypassing two-factor authentication, and then I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So Brian or Terry or Bo, could one of you guys please hit the uh, recording button? Oh, the recording button's already going. All right, yeah, man. So we I, all... I wanted everyone to, I wanted everyone to see your blizzard, you know. I wanted that to be on the recording. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, show us outside again. And Brian, I've been trying to convince Bo to move up to South Dakota for like a long time, and uh, <laughs> I, I think that me showing him the foot and a half of snow outside is probably not helping that situation at all. Um, yeah. Carrie, yeah. Carrie's out tuning up the snow, the snowmobiles, and getting ready, and so she's she's gonna be ready to rock and roll. All right, everybody, so I'll welcome. My, I'll What's stick with my hurricanes. You got the hurricanes. That's fine. <laughs> so, everybody, thank you very much for coming to this webcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that's a little bit different. Well, we're going to be talking about kind of the anatomy of attacking an application throughout the course of a year. Uh, throughout the course of 2016, we really kind of focused on Outlook Web Access because it is something that is constantly available on the outside of networks. Anytime you scan it, it's almost always a low or medium vulnerability if it's not patched. But very rarely is it actually used as an attack point because it's everywhere. Because it is a direct access into sensitive data, we kind of double down. Um, and we're going to go through the chronology of how that actually happened uh, throughout the course of the year from username, harvesting, domain harvesting, uh, still 
power harvesting passwords um, whenever two-factor authentication is enabled, and then finally accessing data even whenever two factors enabled, enabled through Exchange Web Services. And the reason why this webcast is important is you've heard me talk about architecture. You know, we got beams and things like that behind me. And a lot of architecture is predicated on failure and understanding failure points. This is one of those examples. Whenever we released the vulnerability a few weeks ago, Microsoft said it's not that big of a deal. Um, the people at Exchange Experts said it's not that big of a deal. But it is. We're actively exploiting environments today, and it's a very successful attack. It works for us and everything that we do. So it's very, very important for all of us to pay attention because this is the type of vulnerability that is not just write a Metasploit module and exploit. And also maybe part of the reason why it is not something that is being addressed and fixed as fast as it should be. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. Who do we decide was going to go first this particular round? Uh, you can hand it to me, John. So. All right, dude, I'm going to hand you over the presenter, and I'm going to go on mute. Uh, take it away, guys. Bundle up, John. There we go. Let me share my screen. One second. All right. Okay, so um, as John mentioned, you know, we've been spending a, a good amount of time uh, basically just hacking away at OA for the last year or so now. Um, so we decided to kind of put a webcast together to kind of cover all of the, the different avenues of attack that we've been talking about for the last year. Um, so let's go ahead and just get started with it. So just a quick overview. Um, you know, going into performing in, any sort of external attack against an organization, you know, the, the typical uh, attack surface for most organizations traditionally pretty slim. Um, you know, there's definitely the occasional, uh, you know, remotely exploitable flaw you might run into, but, um, you know, if you've ever run, you know, a Nessus scan or anything against an, an uh, external uh, public-facing network, for most organizations, you're not going to get a whole lot of things that you're going to be like, oh, my God, I can take over this network remotely. Um, so, you know, we've, we started looking at, you know, other avenues to, to getting in, which, you know, obviously phishing is going to be one of the biggest ones that you hear about because it's just so common. Um, but, you know, when you talk about just directly accessing a network remotely, directly trying to compromise through, through a firewall, um, you know, quote, quote unquote, hack in the firewall, um, this, this kind of attack where we're, we're basically just attacking um, a public facing server such as OWA it is becoming more and more common. So um, let's talk about just straight up exchange in OWA just for a minute. Um, so in the last year, there have been a number of different attacks. Um, you know, it's not necessarily that they're new attacks as in like they're, you know, a revolutionary new, brand new thing that nobody's ever heard of before. It's just the way that they've been incorporated into um, to, to speci specifically for OA itself have become kind of like a new thing. Um, and, and again, you know, because it is a publicly facing infrastructure for the most part, um, it's readily available for people to attack. Um, so like, like I said, you know, some of these things we've been talking about for the last year, they're pretty minor, um, but when you combine them, they can be really devastating. It's, it's you know, it's the uh, death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, we, we kind of believe that OWA is quickly becoming, you know, the weak point of a public facing network. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily due to any specific vulnerability, it's due to a number of them uh, put together, which we're going to talk about this entire attack flow um, through this entire webcast. Uh, so, you know, specifically talking about OA, uh, you know, additionally, in, really anything that touches AD um, that's publicly facing, so, you know, VPNs, um, Citrix environments, that kind of stuff, a lot of those, those uh, type of portals have a lot of these same issues that we're going to talk about today. Um, and we're going to talk about username enumeration, we're going to talk about password spraying, um, and, you know, really being able to, to talk to, uh, you know, an internal DC of sorts, you know, being able to talk to AD remotely, um, is really one of the first steps that we, we, we need when we go into attacking an organization. So uh, let's just quick overview of just what pretty much everything we're going to talk about and kind of what we'll end up uh, wrapping up with by the end of this. You know, with, with OA, th these are some of the things you can do. You can obtain valid domain credentials um, through password spraying, which we'll talk about in detail. Um, you can pillage uh, employees' email, obviously. It's, it's meant for email. Um, you know, in O365 environments, you can potentially gain access to other services, so such as SharePoint, um, which we'll talk about why that's important later. Um, and then, um, you know, internal internal phishing can be really uh, successful if you know you have that trust relationship already built between users of an organization, and you have credentials to log in as one of them. Um, you know, basically attacking that trust relationship can um, be devastating. Uh, and then, you know, obviously being able to search for uh, VPN or remote access type of uh, details. 
um, within emails is, is going to end up being important. And then lastly, we'll talk about just straight up gaining remote compromise, gaining a remote shell through OA and Outlook, which um, it's a very, very fun attack. Which So one thing I wanted to, I, I forgot to mention is within this presentation, I think we have a total of maybe like 25 slides or something um, because most of this presentation is going to be demo. And uh, you'll see that very soon. So uh, reconnaissance. So you know, with, with going into any attack against an organization remotely, what's the first step? Recon. Um, so before we even look at, at attacking an OS server or attacking an organization, we try to just gain some information about the user base, gain some information about the employees, gain information about externally facing hosts, hosts on the network. Um, and some of the ways we do that is uh, through, uh, you know, obviously Recon NG is a very, very popular tool that you know, has a lot of different modules built in to, to do uh, various, uh, various searches through public resources and open source uh, resources. And then there's also FOCA, which this is one of our favorites, because what FOCA does is essentially um, does some Google dorks of sorts to, to find public documents on web servers. So uh, what, what I mean by that is like if you were to go to like google.com and you were to do uh, site colon, let's say blackhillsinfosec.com, Basically, that, that specific search parameter is only going to search blackhillsinfosec.com. Now, if you tack on another parameter called file type, so if you say site colon blackhillsinfosec.com, file type colon PDF, it's going to find only the PDF files that are publicly facing uh, that Google knows about. Um, and, you know, if you start to look for all kinds of different files, you'll find that you can gain, you get access to a lot of these different publicly facing documents and PDFs. Now, why is that important? Well, you know, while they might be publicly facing, um, they generally were generated by someone on an internal network. And whenever you generate a document or a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet, a lot of times there's metadata associated with your user and your workstation on that document itself. So, um, you know, you as an internal employee generating these documents or, or PDFs and then hosting them on a publicly available site, um, it allows an attacker to find those documents, download them, extract the metadata from them, which a lot of times can actually include things like actual uh, valid usernames uh, of internal employees, which, you know, we'll talk about why we want to know the username schema later. I um, mean, obviously, like having access to one user, uh, one username is really not going to be all that important, but knowing the username schema is very important. Um, so, you know, we'll craft a potential employee name list uh, from, from that, as well as things that we can find on th sites like LinkedIn. You know, every, every employee pretty much um, from any organization these days has a LinkedIn account. And um, you know, by just basically harvesting all of the different names from LinkedIn, um, you can start to craft like a, a, very, uh, a very much uh, targeted list of actual employee usernames um, that we'll use later when we go to attack OA. So uh, you know, identifying the target, finding where a mail server is, is generally pretty easy. Um, because, you know, for the most part, organizations want their employees to know where their mail server is so they can access their email remotely. So um, from the, the extent of just basically brute forcing subdomains, for the most part, you can find a mail server by just doing, you know, mail.domain.com, webmail.domain.com, oa.domain.com. A lot of times, like, those are the more common ones. Um, but you can also, uh, for some domains, if they've set up uh, what's called auto-discover uh, DNS records, they can actually, if you, if you just basically... Um, search for auto or you know with the browser go to autodiscover.domain.com it will actually redirect you to where the mail server is it's um it's a function that is built to basically help web clients or email clients to find the mail server so in a lot of cases you can actually locate a mail server just from autodiscover itself um, so you know one, once we have like our our you know general recon we know uh, you know, a few usernames, we might know the username schema, um, we know where the, the, the target mail server is, then it comes to how are we going to actually, you know, go and attack OA. Uh, so for the first part, um, you know, we're going to be using a tool uh, that we wrote called Mail Sniper for the most part. Um, there's definitely, there's a few other uh, pieces to this that don't necessarily use this, but for the most part, we've, we've tried to kind of code this entire attack process into this tool. Um, so it's a PowerShell tool. Uh, for the most part, it, uh, you know, it was generally written for for searching email. Um, so to begin with, it was basically a tool that we wrote to say, hey, I'm on an internal network. I can now search through everybody's mailbox on this domain. Um, so uh, we actually coded in a few other uh, modules to it as well to allow um, uh, more, more advanced searching and more advanced uh, attacking of OA itself. So um, that's Mail Sniper. We're going to be talking about that soon. And I'm actually going to pass it off to Brian now so he can talk about uh, one of his attacks. 
So here, let me see, where's Brian? Oh, cool, awesome, hey everyone. Um, hey, hey, had... Brian's now. Oh, should, should be a presenter. I just gotta show my, switch my screen here. Show my screen. Hey, while we're switching, um, there was one question from Rob for Bo. Um, it was, can this exploit allow Excel of pub and private files? Um, say that one more time. Can this exploit allow Xfil of pub and private files? Um, of pub and private files? I mean, I, I guess the, the question is a little vague there because like of I mean, public files, absolutely you can get them if they're readily available on, um, on a web server. But I mean, private files meaning, you know, if they're not readily available, then probably not. But okay. I've said, uh, I would say if it's in email, we can get to it. Um, that, that's kind of how it would go, because that's the focus of all of this, is focusing on email. Uh, Ray also asked a question, does this work against Office 365 with multi-factor? Um, heard conflicting, the reason why you've heard conflicting is because it does work for a short period of time after two-factor is enabled. And though, what did we find out was the time frame between enabling two-factor and then it finally being pushed down all the way through? Um, I mean, I didn't find like the, the, the max value, time value, but it was at least like an hour or so. Yeah, so that's why you got conflicting answers, is when Bo went through and tested it, he created an account, set up two-factor, tested it, it worked. But if it's running, let's say, for a day, then it does not work. So that's why there was conflicting, and that's why we have, uh, have it set up that way. But let's continue on and, and talk about this uh, a little bit more. So, Brian, take it away. Okay, right, awesome. Um, so, so yeah, so as, as Bo mentioned, um, one of the many things we can do with OAuth portals is we can try to uh, attempt to enumerate the internal domain name, uh, the domain name that users would uh, prepend onto their uh, username when attempting to log into the portal. Um, and it's important uh, on a lot of these logins because without knowing the correct internal domain name, um, you're probably not going to have much success in uh, some of the later attacks that we're going to talk about. And so this is an issue that we kind of discovered uh, through, through researching and testing. And what we found is that when you try to log into an OAuth portal, and actually this, this issue exists on um, internal AD as well too, um, it's, and, and you can see it there. But what we found is that when you, when you attempt to log in, that there's uh, some anomalies in terms of the response time uh, for that authentication process. And basically the gist of it for the domain enumeration is that if you try to authenticate with an invalid domain name and some arbitrary username, that response time is going to be shorter, um, it's going to be predictably shorter uh, than the response time that you're going to see if you give a valid internal domain name with some arbitrary username. Oops. Ah, got to work PowerPoint. There we go. Cool. Um, so just a quick overview of um, the, the general algorithm that you can follow for enumerating out the, the internal domain names is basically generate yourself a list of uh, random domain names and random usernames. And take these, uh, take these combos of invalid domain names, what are likely invalid domain names and usernames, and uh, use those to authenticate against, against the portal. Look at all the response times and use that to get kind of a baseline response time of what you would expect an invalid domain name to give you in terms of that response time. Uh, next, you're going to want to generate up a list of what you think might be likely domain names. Uh, it's usually based upon the company name, and I'll show that in the module, the demo here shortly. And when you do this, you want to go ahead and you want to use a randomly generated username. It's important that you use a randomly generated username uh, when you're trying to guess the correct internal domain name because if you happen to guess a correct username on the internal domain with a with the correct internal domain name, um, it's going to throw you off a little bit. And that actually ties into the next part that we'll get into, which is username enumeration. So we'll get there later. So essentially, uh, once you get to that, um, you can attempt to authenticate with your uh, newly formed uh, likely domain names and username combos and basically just compare the response time. So go through and look to see uh, which one pops out as being a little bit different uh, than all the other ones. And so just a kind of quick uh, disclosure timeline. Uh, basically we sent out four emails to Microsoft uh, starting on October 7th and throughout this entire thing we received absolutely no response. Um, so we figured we'd go ahead and uh, tell everyone about what we found. So with that, let's do a demo.
All right. So I'm going to go ahead and um, the, the portal that we're going to be attacking um, is going to be mail.nanobotsinc.com. Um, if you were to load up this page, uh, basically what you're going to get is you're going to get this IIS uh, default server page. And if you append on OWA, you can see that we do have an OWA portal here at mail.nanobotsinc.com. Cool. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hop on to my uh, command prompt here. I'm going to open up PowerShell with the exec bypass flag. I'm going to import the mail sniper framework. And now I'm going to run um, a newly added module. Uh, it's, not, it's not out on a public, uh, public release yet, but we'll be getting to that soon. So um, invoke the main harvest OWA. And what I need to give it, I need to give it the exchange host name, which in this case is mail.nanoboxinc.com. Um, I need to give it the um, alpha file. Just going to be, um, I don't know, we can just call it potential Oops. and I believe, I think that's it. Let's see. Oh, right. And a company name. I knew I was forgetting something. All right. So now we also give it the name of the company, which in this case is going to be Nanobots Inc. Go ahead and throw in the spaces. Enter. All right. Um, so I'll kind of walk through this as it's going, and we can step back through for anything that uh, goes too quickly. Um, but basically up here, we can see that we generated a, a list of what we think might be uh, the internal domain name. So we've got uh, like the acronym NBI, Nano, Nanobots, Nanobots Inc., Bots Inc., and then we've taken all those and appended on things like .com, .corp, .biz, um, and all that, all that good stuff. Um, up here, what has happened is we determine the baseline response time. So this is what I was talking about, where we basically just generate up a random internal domain name and uh, append on a random, randomly generated username. So we take all those response times, which are milliseconds over on that side. Oh, it's starting to get away from me. And we go ahead and we average them. And then after we average them, we go ahead and set a threshold. In this case, I think I chose like two and a half, something like that. Uh, you might have to play around with it a little bit. Uh, but once we've got that baseline, we've got the threshold, now we go through and we take that list of uh, domain names that we generated based upon the company name, uh, we uh, append on a random, randomly generated username, then we go through, try to authenticate, and look at the response times again. And in this case, we can see here we got a response time of 813, uh, which is substantially higher uh, than any of the other response times that we see. And in our, um, in our experience, this typically indicates that that is the correct internal domain name for this server. And in this case, since we, um, we have this server, I could tell you that is the correct uh, internal domain name. So it goes ahead, outputs to a file. You've got the, the internal domain name, and now you can kind of uh, continue on. So one other uh, quick note, um, this is something that uh, Kent uh, from, from our organization pointed out, but there it, it is, um, sometimes you can actually get the internal domain name by looking at if the company has a self-signed SSL certificate, by inspecting that certificate, uh, sometimes it'll have the correct internal domain name right on that. So just a quick note there before moving on. So the next thing, this is kind of along similar lines to that internal domain name enumeration, uh, but in this case, we're going to try to enumerate and discover um, not only valid usernames, but before we even get to that, to try to determine the valid um, kind of the naming convention that companies use, because many companies will use some, some form of, you know, like first name, uh, last initial, uh, first name, last name, last name dot first name, and so on and so forth. And one thing we can do is we can either try to figure out this form by taking usernames or taking first names, last names that we've gathered up via recon uh, or usernames we've gathered up via recon and use those. Or what we can do is we can also mangle together a list of um, mingle together common first names and last names and try to figure it out from that. So even if you don't have any other information about the company, you might assume that they have uh, somebody with one of these uh, common names that works there and try to figure out the uh, the username scheme from that. 
And so when looking at the username enumeration issue, it is similar to the domain enumeration issue. It is, it's a timing-based um, attack, essentially. But in this case, the timing is actually flipped. And so what we see here is that if you attempt to authenticate with a valid domain name and some arbitrary username, so some invalid username, that response time is going to be longer than if you have the correct domain name with a valid username. And so that's what I was talking about earlier, that when you're trying to uh, enumerate the domain name, it's important to use a username that you do not think actually exists. Otherwise, it's going to mess with your results if you just happen to guess a valid username as well. And so um, let's skip on to the next one here. And so the, the overall algorithm technique is that we're going to generate up our list of random usernames. We're going to use the valid domain name that we obtained in the previous uh, step. So when we did the domain enumeration, we're going to take that domain name. We're going to use that here. And again, we're going to generate up a, a list of what we think are invalid usernames. And we're going to use this combo of valid domain, invalid usernames to get our baseline response time. And so from there, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to authenticate with um, a list of uh, lists that's formed using common names, so common first names, common last names, or the names that you found from recon. And we're going to try multiple formats for each name. So we're going to take this list, we're going to look at the response times, and we're going to compare that response time uh, to our baseline response time to try to figure out which of these names is potentially valid. And once we have that, so once we know the form, then we can go from there and we can generate up a larger list uh, using the, the email address mangler um, or some other method uh, once we know the correct form. So disclosure, I actually disclosed this uh, to Microsoft at the same time that I disclosed the domain enumeration issue. And so response or timeline's the same, and again, no response. So I'm going to hop back over here. All right. I, um, we have a couple of questions while you're kind of switching around. Um, okay. Somebody was ask, asking about um, the Thread Gateway from Microsoft and ISA. We don't see that very much, and in fact, those products have been end of life since uh, 2014. I'm sure that they're still there, but we just don't see them all that often as well. Um, a bunch of people were asking questions about other products that allow you to access your email outside of uh, like Exchange Web Services. Yeah, pretty much anything that you can authenticate through without using two-factor, um, that would be something that we need to be worried about. Um, and then Ray asked a question, and Brian, I'll throw this to you. So should a company keep the Office 365 and internal Active Directory separate instead of moving towards federated services? The users are going to most likely use the same password anyway, and I, I think that that's true. But I'll throw it over to you, Brian. So, sorry, the, the question was, uh, should they keep Outlook and AD separate? Is that the question? Yeah, Office 365 and Outlook, or excuse me, Active Directory separate. So, if you're using Office 365, you shouldn't, should you or should you not be federating into your internal Active Directory structure? Um, that, that, that is a good question, because uh, as you said, I mean, they're probably going to end up using the, the same password anyways, but I'll... Um, I hate to slot that off, but I'm going to pass it over to Bo and Carrie to see what their thoughts are on that. Yeah. Um, Robert asked, he said, what could Microsoft do to fix this? I would say this one's easy. They should read the OWASP Top 10. OWASP Top 10 has been around for a very long time. You should not have messages that we can easily identify user IDs and passwords and domains just by timing or response sizes. So basically, they should go back to some basic web application security, take those classes and make sure that they implement them. All right, Brian, back to you. OK. Um, excellent. So the um, next thing we'll look at here is the uh, essentially the, the username enumeration. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, this script that uh, Bo actually wrote, uh, but he was nice enough to let me demo it uh, just since it ties in with, uh, with kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. So uh, basically what this is going to do is he has the script, and then here we have these name lists. So we have top five first names, top five last names, and then um, a couple other uh, different iterations of this. So, you know, male, female, um, so on and so forth. And so we're going to use these to, uh, to form uh, potential usernames uh, using common formats for those usernames. 
And so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to import module. And by the way, my lowercase d on my keyboards has suddenly stopped working. So I will be putting uppercase d's in case you're wondering. <laughs> Thankfully, it still works. Um, so I'm going to import module uh, email address mangler. And I'm going to invoke email address mangler. And I'm going to give it first name list, which is going to be name list. Uh, top five first names, and that's going to be name list, top five last names, and then it's going to be all combos. I'm going to pipe that out to outfile, decoding, ASCII, and then uh, we'll just call it, I don't know, names.txt, name plus.txt. All right, so we run that. Um, you can see it mangled up names for us, at least that's what it told us. So uh, username list, hop in here, and we can see we have various combinations of names, starting with uh, James-B, uh, you know, John-B, so basically first name dash something, uh, first name uh, last initial and quite a few other combinations here, but basically we have a, a, a list that we can we can try out against this portal. So I've already got the mail sniper module uh, imported, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to run another um, module from that. Oops, get my D working. Invoke, sorry, uh, enumerate. There we go. Username harvest. All right. So I'm going to give it user list, uh, which is going to be name list. I'm going to give it the exchange server, which is mail.nanobots.com, nanobotsinc.com. And I'm going to give it the domain. And in the last step, we found that to be nanobots. And I'm going to pipe the results. I'll file. Let's actually. Out file. All right, so go ahead and run it. And again, um, we're getting a baseline response time uh, by taking the valid domain name that we determined in that previous step, uh, appending on a random username, and then uh, averaging those out and then setting a threshold, remembering that this time a valid username with a valid domain name will give us a shorter response time than a valid domain name with an invalid username. So here we're going through the dashes. Uh, it's looking like it might not be the dashes. We have those response times. They're all above the threshold that we've set. So we'll let it keep going. Now we're getting into the next uh, format. So we're moving on from that uh, dash format. Oh, look, look, we got a hit. So we've got uh, John S. We've got Michael J. We've got Robert B. And looking at the response time, so we see 299. Uh, 330, 311. Uh, so we have, uh, we can see that those are substantially shorter um, and that these are potentially valid uh, usernames on the domain. And so at this point, now that you know the format, uh, you can go through and you can generate up a larger list of usernames, either be, that you've gathered via recon or by doing this mangle method uh, with common names and then continue on to the next step. And so with that, um, I think I'll pass it over to Carrie. Are you up next? No, I think it's back to me for just a, a moment there, Brian, and then um, and then Carrie will be up next. Okay, cool. So I'll go ahead and I'll pass it back to you. All right, Bo, you are the presenter. Yes. Okay. So um, if you've ever seen us give a webcast, you know we talk about password spraying quite a bit, um, and the reason is because we, you know, it's it's pretty uh, successful attack for us. Um, you know, very commonly will perform password spraying attacks against organizations and gain access to a ton of credentials. Um, so when it comes to password spraying, if you, if you haven't actually heard us talk about it before, basically what that means is we are going, going to try one password attempt per user. Um, so we're going to, going to try to stay out of the bounds of actually locking out accounts. You know, most organizations have some sort of account lockout policy, whether it be, you know, five attempts, ten attempts, um, and we're going to try to maintain some sort of level under that. And basically, you, you gener up, generate up a nice user list, um, which, you know, as he just discovered, uh, we know the username format now. Um, so it becomes like, okay, let's, let's now generate up with uh, the usernames we found at Recon, um, as well as uh, brute forcing, just like, let's say we take the top 100 first names, the top 200 last names, 
and mangle that together into a you know a fairly large size list of potential usernames, um, and then run a password spraying attack against OA with that. Um, so I will go ahead and demonstrate what that looks like real quick. Um, all right, so uh, you know he. Whenever Brian just performed his uh, enumeration attack, we saw that you know we had like Michael J uh, was the correct format, you know first name, last initial. Um, so I went ahead and I just generated a very small list of common names just so we can kind of prove a point here. Um, but you know in, in a real attack, what you would do is you would take all the names you found in recon, um, mangle those into a list similar to this, um, as well as brute force together a bunch of different common names. Um, so what I'll do is I will go ahead and uh, import Mail Sniper here. And um, to perform a password spraying attack with uh, Mail Sniper, there's actually two different modules, um, one for OA and one for EWS. I'm going to show you how it uh, looks against OA. So uh, that module is invoke-passwordsprayOA. And to, to password spray OA, what you need to do is you've got to give it uh, your user list, the, the list of users you want to password spray, which in this case is going to be our common names list. Um, we're going to give it a password. Um, so, you know, in, in the grand scheme of uh, common passwords, what do we find most often? Uh, season and year. So we're going to go with summer 2016, um, and then um, we're going to point it at the exchange host, which in our case is mail.nobotsinc.com. So uh, whenever this runs, what's going to happen is for each of these users, it's going to attempt to log into OA. So uh, it'll connect to the mail.nanobotsinc.com. Um, it will attempt to actually log in as each one. And if it obtains a valid credential, if, if it was successful in logging in to OA, um, we should get a result here. Um, so um, in this case, we were successful with one user. Um, you know, in this case, we have Michael J at nanobotsinc.com, whose password was summer 2016. And again, you know, the, while this, you know, this demo is very much uh, us, you know, constructing it to just prove a point, this is how it looks in real life. And whenever we generate these lists and we try 10,000 different usernames, this happens. Um, so what's, why is it okay? I mean, why, why does it matter that we only got one credential? So let's talk about uh, the next step. So we've gained access to one credential now. Now. Now that we have one credential, we can uh, actually pull down something from OA called the global address list. So within Outlook Web Access, um, you actually have the functionality to see everyone else's email address. Um, it's it's a you know a, a, a feature of OA, right? Um, to you know if you were to go to send an email to somebody else, you you know click the to field, and you can you know auto typically auto complete somebody's email address um, from that. Um, so you know, we wrote a module called get dash global address list to do that. So let me show you that real quick. So um, get dash global address list. So now that we have the one credential of Michael, Michael J, so we'll uh, give his username here, Michael J at nanobotsinc.com. We'll give his password of summer 2016, pointed at exchange host name, nanobotsinc.com. And it's going to go, it's going to log into OWA. Um, it has to retrieve a couple different cookies and then um, basically pulls down the, the global address list right here. So in our little test domain, this is all the users we have, but you can see this is, this is every single mailbox that was an exchange. And you know, if you were to do this against you know, a larger environment, let's say, say that has like 3,000 users, you're going to be able to get all the user accounts doing the exact same technique. Um, so from here, uh, you know, one of the next steps would be to go back and perform more password spraying with your valid list now. So, you know, we've, we've gone and uh, with one credential now have access to every single email address uh, from the organization, which, you know, from, from having that, you, we can now perform extremely more targeted password spraying attacks and potentially gain access to a lot more credentials. Um, you know, we're not just guessing based off of recon and uh, mangling together uh, usernames anymore. We actually have the exact username list now from the global address list. So um, let me show you what that looks like real quick and then I'm gonna hand it off to Carrie to show you another way of doing this. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and copy in those addresses. So these are our, 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 our normal, um, or our, our actual user addresses here. Um, let me just save that. And then um, we'll go back up to our password spray. And instead of our uh, typical just common names list, we'll actually give it the more, t more targeted uh, uh, global address list now. And run, let's run it with the same password and see what we get. 
Um, so again, you know, we, we've now obtained the actual global address list. We're going to try one password attempt per each of these users. And, um, you know, once it's done, we'll potentially have more credentials. Here you go. So you see we got three now. So now we have uh, Vladdy at nanobotsinc.com, um, Bamas at nanobotsinc.com, and uh, Michael J. They all have a password of summer 2016. And, you know, again, this is just to prove a point. This is, this is how it looks in real life. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to kind of point out and what Carrie's going to talk about a little bit more is that this works against two-factor as well. Um, so the fact that I was able to just uh, connect to OA and submit a, a password or a, a login request, um, like for, for this account here, Vladdy, let me show you what, what is actually going on in the background there. So if we go actually try to log in as Vladdy, Got to go to OWA. So let's log in as Vladdy and see what happens. We get a two-factor authentication prompt. So we're not getting into his account here, but two-factor is enabled, and we were able to successfully guess his password. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, getting around this in a little bit, but Carrie also has something that she would like to talk about uh, right now. So, John, can you pass it over to Carrie, please? Sure will. I also want to point out very, 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 very clearly that what we're going to discuss moving forward is not a vulnerability in Duo or any two-factor authentication vendor. In fact, Duo was awesome to work with. They freaked out a little bit to begin with. Okay, so they freaked out a lot, um, but they didn't... Oh, we lost you, John. For the next few minutes, for the rest of this webcast, that is a vulnerability in Duo. I can't right, hear so, Carrie. There she is. Okay, so what I was going to demo here is a, a little bit of a different way to password spray using Burp, just as another option. Um, and also how it works against two-factor. So I'm going to put in a made-up username XXX. Summer 2016 is going to be our guest for this spray, and I'm going to intercept this request. And I'm going to send it to Intruder, and I'm going to mark this spot, the spot where he wants to substitute the username. So instead of XXX, we're going to Oops. We're going to substitute in whatever usernames we have on our list. And I'm just going to type in a few, but you could import a list here. Okay, so as Bo just showed, um, if the password's correct, you get a secondary screen that says, um, in this case, something about Duo, how you want to get your two-factor authentication. You don't actually get in, but it's different than if the password's wrong, which you get something that says, sorry, wrong username, password. So the response is different. So if we start this attack, we, we see that um, the, the length of the response is different, and that's a giveaway that um, this may have worked. So. If we went and looked at this response, we would uh, see that we get redirected to that Duo page. So that's a simple way to do with the intruder tool to look for that difference in uh, response. One thing that's different with Microsoft MFA multi-factor authentication is you don't get that secondary screen. So um, with if their two-factor solution is MFA, it when you log in, it'll just sit here and spin like it is here. It won't return anything until the user accepts their push notification. You'll, they'll get a text or a phone call or a push notification on their phone. And until they respond to that, um, you won't get a server response. So you can't look for that difference in response link. Um, but there is a little flaw with uh, Outlook in that case, too. And so I've got this. Uh, blog post here on our site, what can I learn from Password Brain 2FA? The first part is Brian's discoveries with username and numeration. And the second part just points out that if you uh, look at the responses, there's a slight difference from Microsoft if the password is correct versus incorrect. So if the password is incorrect, you get redirected to slash OWA. 
but if it's correct, you get redirected to a slash OWA. And so when you're doing that attack, you want to go in here to the options and choose to follow the redirects. And we'll repeat this again for what we've got going, process cookies and redirections, and then repeat the attack. And And we see that in the case where the password is right, we got two redirects that we followed. And, and so that's where you can look in those responses and determine whether you got, you got that different response. So even with Microsoft MFA that doesn't give you a different second screen, um, you can tell that the password is right. And you might be thinking that you can just look at the response time because it takes a while for a user to respond. But what I found is that some users aren't set up with two-factor. In that case, it immediately rejects uh, the password. Even though it's correct, the response is immediate. So you can't rely on response time completely, or you'll miss some correct passwords that you have found just because the user hasn't been set up with uh, two-factor off. And then just one other thing with um, Burp that I wanted to show. If we actually log in, uh, We actually log in as one of these people. But will you be able to accept the two-factor auth on this? Sure thing. OK. Just send a push. Is that what you do? Yep. OK. I do think it's hilarious. Jordan just got back to me and he said that we've got over 100 active connections to our exchange environment, nanobotsinc.com. So, uh, so that's, that's fun. We're literally giving people hack by numbers to one of our dev environments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, I'm showing a secondary way to download the address book. It's harder than using Bose solution with PowerShell, but sometimes it may be the only option that works. So here, if we go to the target tab and we look at um, mail nanobots, there's this finding that says email addresses disclosed. And it starts listing out all email addresses it's seen. So um, if we, what I do if I'm trying to get the address book this way is I start a new mail and I say to and it usually comes up defaulting to your local contacts, but if you if you go to the global address list, it'll list them all. And you see them populating. Burp has extracted those for you based on uh, the address book. And the only trick here is if it's got a lot of entries in the address book, you actually have to scroll through it, uh, holding down on the down arrow key through the whole address book, because it only loads as it needs to be seen. So it's on-demand loading. So to get all those like thousands of entries to show up, you have to actually have to scroll down through the whole list. And then it's easy to copy and paste into Excel from this uh, BERT finding here. And there's also a blog post uh, on that called Downloading an Address Book from OWA on a Black Hill site. OK, back to you, Bob. All right. John, can you pass that back, please? Or Sierra, Sierra, somebody. <laughs> I got it. All right, there you go. got it. You got it. Sweet. Okay, so um, you know, to kind of follow up on on what she was just showing a little bit, you know, with a two-factor auth, um, this is something we we kind of released a couple weeks ago, um, where we kind of uh, discovered that you know a lot of the different softwares um, for two-factor aren't actually covering all of the protocols that are alongside of OA um, and Exchange in general. So with Exchange. Um, you know, a, a lot of people just have like the mentality that you know you've got this this Outlook Web Access front end, and that's that's the only way that people are going to be able to log in and actually obtain emails from my organization. Um, the fact of the matter is, there's a number of other protocols uh, right alongside OA, um, and a lot of times those are not actually covered by two-factor authentication. 
Um, so I'm going to demo that in just a moment. But um, I also want to talk about like how um, you know you can basically read emails through this, and that's that's why like why we think it's so important is because you can not only just bypass 2FA, but you know we have the power to just straight up read emails through this secondary protocol. Um, you know, it's basically you know you have all these clients like uh, you know Outlook for Mac that do not have the ability to connect to Exchange using the traditional method of um, you know talking to OWA. Um, so they have to actually use these secondary. It's basically like a secondary API for obtaining emails and sending emails. Um, so let's let's demo that real quick. So you can see here, uh, you know, I, I got the the Duo hit uh, a little bit ago, and like let's say I don't have um, you know the secondary method of authenticating. Um, what you can do is talk to EWS, which is Right alongside, uh, right alongside um, OA. So if we go to mail.nanobotsinc.com/ews, and again, this is a default thing on most uh, most exchanges. It says you get this this prompt, right? So if I log in here as Vladdy at nanobotsinc.com, give us password. Um, it should give us the XML page. Something happened there. Not sure why that got redirected, but um, let's see. Let's see if it works. If I actually try to read his email, um, so invoke self search is the module that we're going to run. Um, we need his uh, his user or email address. Mailbox. So we'll give it his mailbox of Vladdy at nanobots. Inc. Com. Um, we'll give it his password. Or actually, uh, we're gonna um, since this is a remote attack, we're gonna give it the exchange host name first, which is mail. Inc. Com, and then we'll give it uh, the dash remote flag, which will basically prompt us for credentials. So here um, we are logging essentially directly into uh, essentially directly into um, uh, EWS. So if this is successful, what should happen is instead of trying to connect to OA, we're going to basically go right alongside it to EWS. Yeah. So basically, what's happening here is it's connecting to his inbox in EWS and searching for the terms password, creds, and credentials. Um, so you know, to to the uh, you know sysadmin who who implemented this, they basically said, uh, you know what, I want two-factor authentication on my OA portal. Um, but most of these softwares, they basically say they don't even cover these. Um, you know, right alongside it. It's not necessarily that it's a vulnerability. It's just it, in, in the two-factor authentication software. It's that they're basically just not covering these other protocols. And which you know traditionally, um, there have been other attacks similar to this, um, where on internal networks, some two-factor authentication softwares won't cover all the protocols for a given system, right? So uh, what I'm talking about is, for example, RDP. Um, you know, a lot of times you have like RDP that's covered by like let's say an RSA two-factor. But right alongside it, you've got SMB on a different port, which might not be covered, and you could connect in over SMB. Um, but in this example, the the thing that I think is kind of the bigger problem here is it's it's that they're all on the same port on the same web server, just a different URL. Um, but you can see here that we were actually able to read his email, um, and we you know found one that had the subject of VPN login info, um, secret password inside, etc. Um, so. You know, whenever you know, whenever we get to this point in the attack, what we're essentially going to try to do now is, you know, find emails that would help us get remote access, right? Help us find uh, where's a VPN? Are there any other passwords we can get through that? Um, could we potentially um, send up an email as this person? Um, but let's say we didn't get VPN access. Let's say we didn't get remote access through that technique. That's okay. There's there's a brilliant attack that uh, was released about a year ago that Nick Landers from uh, Silent Brick Security discovered, where he found that Outlook clients sync Outlook rules across clients. Um, and so, so why is that important? He found that you know for some reason Outlook, uh, you can actually set a rule that when you get an, an email, when somebody sends you an email with a subject or whatever, or you can set a, a number of different triggers. Whenever you get that email, you can actually start an application. Now, um, the, the thing about this is like, if, if I have Outlook, if I have your credentials and I have an Outlook instance set up and I'm not on your network, I can load up Outlook, I can create this rule that says, hey, whenever you receive this email with this subject, run this payload on my web dev server out on the internet. So it becomes, you don't even have to fish anybody anymore. All you have to have is a valid credential to log into to Outlook. And so there've been a couple tools that have been released. Um, one of them is Ruler. Um, that right now, um, that one only works over Mappy over HTTP, which 
that uh, actually will only work in Exchange SP1 and above. Um, but they, I, I've noticed they've been working on getting it working with RPC over HTTP, which is Outlook Anywhere, which there was a question earlier about Outlook Anywhere and um, you know potential attacks through Outlook Anywhere. So um, this this specific attack is the the one that uh, you know for for legacy versions of Exchange um, will sync over Outlook Anywhere. And uh, Carrie is actually going to walk through a demo right now of of how this actually looks. So uh, Carrie, take it away. All right, let's wait a second so I can share my screen here. Okay, so what we're looking at is a VM that represents our attacking machine. It's just my local machine. It's not on the customer's domain. It's not the victim's machine. It's my own machine. So I can start up Outlook Web Access, and or not, I can start up Outlook, and first time I start it up, it'll ask me to enter the email and password. So we just discovered that through our prior efforts of password spring and then you just continue through that and it will set it up for you automatically. I've already done that so here I have access to Darth V at Nanobots Inc. So we're going to go in and create a rule. And when we do this we're just going to go to options and import a rule. And I've already made the rule file. I'm going to go back and show you how later but I wanted to get it in there and get it going because it takes a few minutes to get the shell. So we're going to import our pwn rule. And what it says is apply this rule after the message arrives with pwn you in the subjects and start 22.exe. 22.exe is a PowerShell Empire executable to get a shell on the box and it's out on a web dev server on the internet. And so we're going to apply that and say OK. Now, the magic is that this is going to get automatically synced to the victim's computer where they run Outlook, so on the internal domain. And it happens very quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm not showing the victim uh, VM right now, but I just checked and it's already synchronized over there. So I'm going to close down Outlook here so I don't get a shell on my own box when I send the email. And I'm just pressing send on the email with pulling you in the subject. Okay, and um, while we're waiting, I'll direct you to the Silent Break Security uh, blog post. Uh, it's very good, and it's washing through this, um, and including how to create your, your shell.exe to work with PowerShell Empire. Uh, there are a few little gotchas and a few places where the instructions weren't ver verbose, so I added another blog post on the Black Hill site. Uh, malicious Outlook rules and actions, and it gets you past the first gotchas that you have to actually use Python 3 when you run it instead of Python 2 or you get that error. And then it gives really detailed instructions on setting up your web dev server to work with this attack. So you've got that there. So if we go over and um, we've downloaded, we're using Python version 3, but we've downloaded the, the silent break security rules.py script to generate that rules file. So we're going to run that and we're going to call it my rule and then just ask you some questions. What's the rule name? So we give it a name and what's the trigger? So what do you want to put in the subject of the email that will make this uh, rule fire off? And um, so we could do anything here. So we could get the subject of anything and then here you put your web dev IP adder here and then wherever your file is so we have 22.exe and then that created your rule file my rule rwz and so I showed how to import that at the beginning um, let's see I think I covered everything here so I'm going to switch over to the victim VM Okay, so here's here's the victim. It just barely got that email, that phone you email, so we should be getting a shell soon on this box. So this represents a system that I don't currently have access to on uh, Vladdy or Darth V's system on the internal domain, presumably, and he's running Outlook or will be running Outlook in order to get that mail and fire that rule. We can see that if we go to manage rules on his system, it's got that rule in there. Okay. 
And so, and of course, I haven't got the shell yet. <laughs> but uh, we'll wait on that. One other thing that I'll show while we're waiting, go back to that other VM, is uh, is that you can go in and edit that rule to do things like after it runs the executable, immediately delete the file. And so that makes it less likely that someone would see this and report it. Um, and there is one trick when you do that. Um, if we go back to our rule. So you click on it and say edit rule. It does something tricky when you edit though. Let's say we wanted to add in, delete it afterwards. And it adds in this on this computer only, which we don't want because we want sync to the, synchronize it to the other computer. But you have to actually go ahead with this and finish. And then you have to go and edit it one more time and remove that setting. So uncheck on this computer only. And now you have a, a more sly rule here to work with. And that's all I have. That would give me the PowerShell um, session on that victim machine, which I'm not able to show you at the moment. Um, and then I could uh, do whatever you do once you get internal access on a, on a machine. So back to you, Bill. All right. Let's see, let me share your screen. Okay. All right, so um, we've only got a couple more minutes left, so let's go ahead and kind of summarize everything that we just talked about. Um, you know, we started with nothing. We had no access whatsoever. We performed recon, we gathered a bunch of usernames and, and various uh, employee names. We mangled those into, um, you know, a, a user list uh, to use later. Um, we found the, the OS server, which is not that hard. Um, in most environments anyway. We performed internal domain enumeration. So we were able to discover an internal domain name. We are able to uh, figure out a username convention uh, by basically just brute forcing various conventions. Uh, we were able to perform username enumeration, then password spraying. So once we had uh, some valid usernames, we were able to ac actually perform password spraying to gain access to just one credential. That's all we needed. Once you have one credential, you can then acquire the global address list from, from Exchange. Now that you have the global address list, you perform more password spraying. And you know, with more password spraying comes more credentials, comes more access to various different resources. Um, so you know, one of the things we didn't actually talk about much here was uh, you know, if, if the organizations, let's say it's O365 and they have SharePoint um, and a number of other services in the cloud, um, you know, at this point, once you've got credentials, you might actually be able to uh, you know, start searching around some more internal resources in SharePoint. Um, and a lot of times, uh, we've actually had tests that I've been on where um, in SharePoint alone, we found you know, information about how to VPN into the network, um, you know, including like pins you might need as like a quote unquote second factor um, to get in. So um, you know, being able to have credentials is important. Um, and then secondly, we were able to bypass uh, two-factor authentication um, just to read email. And then you know, the rest of the attacks basically uh, lead us to remote compromise. So, you know, whether or not we found how to VPN in, how to RDP in, um, how, to, how to actually just straight up get remote access, or whether or not we ran the malicious outlook rules, or even at this point we could perform employee to employee phishing, meaning, you know, once we have an account of somebody that can log into OA, we can now start looking through their email and figure out their trust relationships and start abusing those um, between employee to employee. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up, I mean, Basically, like this is our whole attack flow here. Um, there were a lot of links in this uh, webcast, so I, I created this uh, one slide that kind of encompasses all of them. Um, you know, highly recommend definitely checking them out. But again, you know, this is stuff we've been talking about for the past year, so we thought it'd be nice to just kind of throw it all together in one single webcast. Um, but that is it. So uh, for now, that so that's it. And if there are any questions, I mean, John, uh, you can take it away. You bet. All right, so a couple of quick things we, can, we need to clarify. Thing number one, this has nothing to do with dual security once again. Um, they were very nice. They could have freaked out a little bit more than they did, um, but they were pretty cool about it, just as long as we clarified that we were just using duo for articulative purposes. Thing number two, there's a lot of people that are asking, how do we stop this? And that's kind of why we're doing this webcast. 
Mind you, we went to Exchange Experts, we went to Microsoft, and they basically looked at all of this and they said, mm, not a problem, nothing to see here, this is not a concern. In fact, Bill, if I remember correctly, they said, well, that's the way it's architected. If the architecture is broken, um, I usually don't like picking fights very often in computer security, but I, I, think, I think we'll pick one now. Microsoft has to fix this. And this is something that is an easy fix. In fact, this is something that organizations that have been developing web applications have been doing and fixing for years. We should not, at a fundamental level, be able to enumerate user IDs. We should not be able to enumerate passwords. And we sure should not be able to enumerate passwords through two-factor authentication by looking at the timing and the size of the response from the web server. This is OWASP top 10. This is split kitty level computer security stuff that these guys can fix, and they should fix. They're a multi-billion dollar corporation. You want to find out where the blame is, if blame is squarely on Microsoft's shoulders. Also, with what Bo and everybody has done, is they have opened up a way that we can get direct access to the most sensitive parts of an organization, not just files, but emails. The most sensitive things we find are emails within organizations from a day-in, day-out penetration testing, um, you know, kind of what we do trying to find true risk insofar as exploitation. This is a remote exploit. This does not require me to get a zero day. This does not require an attacker to, you know, pivot through spear phishing. This can be done simply by going through the, the methodology that Bro put up on, I think this slides back a little bit. So this is why we're frustrated, is this is something that should be an easy fix, this should be something that should have been fixed years ago, and unfortunately a lot of people just don't want to fix it. But Josh Wright does a lot, Josh Wright is another chance as well, and he says that most organizations will not fix vulnerabilities in their software until they're a Metasploit module written for it. Unfortunately, this isn't something that can be written very easily into a Metasploit module. Believe me, it's, it's possible, you could absolutely do that, but I don't ever think it's going to be a set target exploit type module. But we walked through the process in under an hour on how to do this, and this is very dangerous. So immediate steps of what you can do to protect yourself. If you do not need Exchange Web Services, shut it down. Um, just shut it down. And you might make a couple of executives mad who want to use Outlook for Mac, but, but shut it down. Also, be looking at other applications like ActiveSync, possibly SharePoint, that maybe have the exact same type of attack surface, but don't have uh, factor authentication enabled. Another great short-term solution, put your email behind a VPN. For the love of all the tolling, there is no way that we should be able to touch anything that is directly accessing Active Directory from the open internet. We need to learn this lesson, we need to learn it very, very, very quickly. If you want to move forward, set up a VPN, somebody has to VPN, then they can access their email through AWS, they can access their email through um, through um, Outlook Web Access. We need to put some better protections around this. We're learning time and time again, the more you expose your sensitive assets directly against the open internet, the more vulnerabilities we're going to have. Um, we've been trying to answer a tremendous amount of, of questions as we've gone through. I, I think that we have, um, but, uh, but no, absolutely, um, with this, please, uh, thank you very much for coming. Please check out our next webcast that's coming through, and please start putting pressure on Microsoft to try to get this fixed. Um, hopefully they get it fixed. We could have just sat on it for the next five years and continued to exploit environments. Remember, the goal of a pen testing firm is not to exploit things and prove that they can exploit things, but it's to make things better, and that's ultimately what we are trying to do. So thank you so much, everyone, and get out of here. And for those of you that are in bad weather or about to be in bad weather, stay warm. Take care, everybody.